Hello, everybody. My name is Danny Holmberg. I'm a principal scientist at SEER. And today I'm looking forward to talk with you about the proteograph, which is a nanoparticle based solution to dive deep into the plasma proteome. So just as a starter, let's quickly discuss why, first of all, it's interesting to go deep into the plasma proteome, but also why it's really challenging. So as you know, like the plasma proteome comes with a pretty demanding dynamic range in that only a minority of the proteins contribute a majority of the protein mass, which comes as a main challenge for every downstream detector. However, the really interesting signatures of, for example, your health and disease state may be, uh, be present actually down here where you have the interleukins, for example, uh, at the very low abundant range. And it is really tough to identify those in an untargeted manner. Now, of course, there are ways to dive deep into the proteome, for example, a deep proteomics workflow entailing high abundant protein depletion, uh, as well as peptide fractionation with high pH, uh, uh, of the separation of the peptides before you inject into the mass spec. The issue here is that, as you can already see, the workflow is pretty complicated. It's not something that you can easily integrate uh, across the world in different labs, and, and therefore it's also hard to really compare the data. On top of that, it takes some time to get that deep into the proteome, which means you are compromised in terms of how many samples you can measure. It's probably hard, if not impossible, to scale that beyond hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of subjects in longitudinal profiling efforts, for example. At SEER, we develop a solution to the inherent challenge of plasma proteomics, which is a combination of getting deep into the proteome as well as enabling that at scale. And the core of our technologies are nanoparticles. And in the simplest design concept, they are super paramagnetic cores that we surround by a glass surface, which we then can tune and modify with organic, inorganic chemistries, polymers, uh, literally everything that you can think of in terms of chemistries. And by that, we really are able to engineer and tune how these uh, particles look like, how they uh, appear to to proteins in your sample. Now, when you introduce those particles into a complex biological matrix, what happens is that in a very reproducible manner, a so-called protein corona forms, which is essentially like a shell of proteins and other biomolecules that are driven into the uh, uh, onto the surface of the particle based on their compatibility um, in terms of their physical chemical um, makeup and the particle's physical chemical makeup. Now, that helps us in diving deep into the plasma proteome in that we leverage one specific aspect that can be independent of the abundance, which is the affinity. Now, affinity times concentration will um, eventually determine the composition of the protein corona here. But since affinity in itself is not dependent on the concentration, we can have a lever here for, 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 for using a property uh, to dive deep into the proteome. And this is, in fact, a well-known effect called the Roman effect, which describes uh, the assembly of proteins on a surface that pre-equilibrium is driven by basically just the abundance. But then at equilibrium, you basically displace very high abundant but low affinity proteins by low abundant proteins that have a higher affinity. And that is the core of our technology. And you can imagine if you now combine multiple particles that are ortho orthogonal and synergistic in terms of what type of properties across many, many different hundreds and thousands of proteins they capture, you can get a panel that interrogates throughout the entire dynamic range. Again, it's important to note that concentration still plays a role here. It's just that we effectively uh, compress the dynamic range for low abundant proteins in order to render them more visible to downstream detectors. We integrated that solution in the proteograph suite, which is a back-to-end solution to dive deep into the plasma proteome. So we have everything from consumables, including all the enzymes and buffers you need, uh, as well as a liquid uh, handling uh, automation uh, uh, um, uh, instrument that essentially takes you from your biospecimen to the peptides within six and a half hours. You can then inject that into your mass spec. And we also provide the data analysis suite, which provides not only uh, access on the cloud to state-of-the-art um, proteomics, computational proteomics tools, such as Max1, but also enables you to do QC uh, analysis uh, in a very, very well-controlled manner. So you are able to compare results across time and across labs. Now, one exemplification of the performance of our pipeline is shown on this slide, 
is actually a data set that we recently submitted for publication at PNAS. And what you see here is the photograph's performance for five nanoparticles uh, for the same pool plasma in comparison to deep fractionation, depletion, and deep plasma. And you see that in terms of number of IDs, we are pretty much uh, um, having the largest number of IDs using a short 30-minute uh, gradient on DIA, uh, in particular comparison to, to the fractionation and depletion approach and need plasma. Now, where do we gain the IDs? When you look at the abundance range here, you see that we gain mainly at the lower abundant range. Of course, these are the proteins that are really hard to catch with the alternative workflows. Now, if you just get deeper at scale, it doesn't necessarily help you to really unlock biological insights because if your precision is compromised, you need even more samples to get the same power. So looking at the precision is really important. And as you see here, we compare pretty favorable to a depletion approach, which is actually a much, much simpler way to, to dive a little bit deeper into the proteome. But we have a much, much better performance than, for example, a high pH fractionation. Now, neat plasma still has the highest precision, but remember that neat plasma looks at the top 300 most brightest proteins, whereas we go beyond 1,500 proteins. And of course, there's inherently more uh, uh, noise at, at if you could step orders of magnitude below what the neat plasma approach can see. Now, also keep in mind that uh, these are all very short 30-minute uh, gradients. In fact, it's a 20-minute gradients and 30-minute sample to sample. We want to do as much of an apples to apples comparison here. Of course, if you go for longer gradients for deep fractionation, you will also get higher performance, but this is also the case for the particle pipeline. Now, another important aspect of the performance is the accuracy or like the question of how linear is the response that we can measure. And to assess that, we did a spike recovery experiment, uh, which we also published last year, where we can see that, um, um, for, for, for example, for CRP, we have a linear response even at small spike in levels, starting from the endogenous, um, comparing the, C uh, the ELISA readout uh, to the nanoparticle-derived proteomics information. So this means that the slope is linear, but it's not necessarily always one because, as you remember, we compress the dynamic range. But important is that we can see multiple differences, uh, even small fold changes can be captured with the particles. One, uh, a, a, another exemplification that actually shows us the utility in terms of discovering new biological signatures was also published last year in the same paper. So this was a study where we investigated 141 uh, NSCLC subjects and healthy controls. And um, overall, across all the subjects, we identified close to 2,500 proteins uh, that was all conducted in within two and a half weeks. And we built a random forest classification a classifier here that, that showed a pretty pretty decent performance discriminating between uh, uh, early NSCLC cases and healthy controls. On the right-hand side, you see the features that contributed to the classification, and you see the desirable mix out of red ones, which, which is indicating features that have been implicated in the disease, and those that have not been shown to have any role in the disease yet. So this is what, what from the proteomics perspective, we always like to see a mix out of things we would expect and also things that we well, have not seen before, so potentially new signatures. Now, there are different ways we can further optimize, tune, and improve the pipeline uh, in an R&D effort. So first of all, of course, we can diversify the chemical uh, surface functionalizations. And in fact, we have just submitted a paper that uses machine learning to predict the association of certain combinations of functional groups to the formation of the protein corona. And that's certainly a very exciting avenue we are following up that then can lead into new and expanded panels of nanoparticles that synergistically do a very specific job in deep uh, uh, interrogation of complex biological samples. Of course, that all connects to different ways you can optimize the, the assay, like thinking about multiplexing capabilities with these particles. Since they are all like magnetic, uh, you can easily like transfer them. You can actually adapt any workflow you can imagine. Another really important aspect certainly is the mass spec performance. Uh, uh, since we are talking about the Roman effect, which is a compression effect and, and the competition effect, uh, um, this the mass spec sensitivity actually helps us a lot in terms of getting even deeper into the proteome. And this plays a role in conjunction with the Roman effect. And I'd like to spend the last couple of minutes on showing you how very sensitive mass spectrometry workflows allow us to even dive deeper into the protein corona. Now, 
Just as a brief reminder, the Roman effect talks about the displacement of high abundant proteins by affinity. And this displacement is a function of the competition. So if you have too much surface available, every protein will find a spot to bind. But as soon as the proteins compete for, for common binding sites, you have this affinity factor being really driving the composition here. Now, that means that we can get more separation uh, uh, and distinguishing uh, features on the surface of the particles if the concentration of the particles is, uh, uh, if that concentration is decreased. Of course, that also reduces the yield of peptides, which then can be a challenge for downstream mass spectrometers if you go to an extreme value here and you don't want to increase the input plasma amounts. The experimental setup that, that we want to present here is the following. So we took here an exemplification of two nanoparticles uh, at different concentrations. Uh, all of them were then measured, the protein coronas were measured uh, using a Timstoff Pro with DIA passive, using 20 minute gradients, 30 minute sample to sample uh, time was required, uh, 50 centimeter farm of radix column and max one was basically standard setting for the data analysis. So what you see here is effectively the Roman effect uh, as a function of decreasing nanoparticle concentration. So starting from the neat plasma here, we see that we have a really decent increase of the performance measured in terms of IDs here, uh, up to 200% for this uh, nanoparticle, where we see some degree of saturation of the performance. And for the second nanoparticle, we see a similar trend, although we don't necessarily go to the entire set uh, saturation of the Roman effect here, we go even beyond 300%. So that tells you that this is really something that has to be and can be tuned for individual nanoparticles. And actually, you want to make sure that the entire automation pipeline is really tightly controlled because you want to make sure that you're always sitting at the right and same spot for every assay condition. Another way to look at that is to uh, look at the panel performance level. So in this case, we basically look at the IDs we gain across these two nanoparticles, and also we have here in green neat plasma. Please keep in mind that this is only two nanoparticles instead of the commonly used five. That's why we have a few plasma proteins we are not capturing with these two here. But what you see here is two things. First of all, you see an increase of, of, of the overall IDs uh, pretty significantly, starting from the neat plasma down here to close to a little bit more than 1400 proteins using two nanoparticles uh, and excluding the plasma proteins. And another feature you see is that the JI index actually gets lower. The JI index, the part index, is a measure of the similarity or dissimilarity in terms of IDs. Now that tells us that the more we drive the Roman effect, the more distinct particles become, or in other words, the more distinct the particle coronas become. So we have actually a synergy not only from getting by driving the Roman effect, more IDs per particle, but also the additional IDs we get on each particle are more distinct from each other. So, so that is essentially a really big utility uh, um, that speaks to the power of increasing the Roman effect. However, of course, as we drive the Roman effect, our yield goes down because we have less surface where proteins can bind. Now, that means that there is also a synergy, especially for the really extreme cases where high sensitivity mass spectrometry workflows actually give us a lot of a benefit, uh, uh, which is usually not the case in plasma, where you have enough material and if you have a more sensitive instrument, it doesn't really help you with the performance, but for particle proteomics, it actually has a big impact and it helps you a lot in diving even deeper into the plasma proteome. With that, I'd like to briefly summarize in that the proteograph offers a really scalable and uh, easy accessible way to dive deep into complex biological samples, just as uh, such as the human plasma. Uh, on top of that, there are many avenues that we can further optimize the technologies. And among the options that we have is that we can drive the Roman effect to extreme cases, to, to, to really to the extreme and leverage the affinity space even more. But of course, that scales particularly good with high sensitivity mass spectrometers such as the Tim Stoff. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to speak to you. Please reach out if you have questions. Please reach out if you're looking for new research opportunities in a Silicon Valley startup. We are actively hiring from the biochemist to the data scientist. Thank you so much and have a great day.